Student housing is such a unique industry. The more unique an industry is, the more important it is for that industry to have a resource and a platform to share ideas and data, to determine best practices, and a platform to simply promote networking among the professionals in that industry. That's what we are setting out to provide with Student Housing Insight. Well, what's even more unique about the student housing industry is how unique those professionals are. They want to make a positive impact on the students and the university communities they serve. They understand hey, they have an opportunity to touch the future. They come to work every day looking for ways to make that future bright. If you're one of those people, come be a part of Student Housing Insight. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Shop Talk. Matthew Bercher, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Wes? Great to be here. Happy New Year. Doing fantastic. Uh, if you will, in the chat, if you guys can hear myself and Matthew, I'd just like somebody to put that in there so we know everything is working correctly as I bring up our slides. So how are things going in Washington? Uh, Washington continues to put the fun back into dysfunction, uh, as we may have witnessed from uh, some of the events from uh, last week. Uh, but we're doing well and working um, hard on behalf of the student housing industry. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, we'll get to you in just a second. I'll go through a couple of housekeeping items for everybody. Again, today is Thursday, January 12th. Welcome to the first Shop Talk for 2023. Um, a couple of things, we want to make sure that this is as interactive as it can be. And so we've got a, uh, a chat widget over there in the right-hand side of the screen. Feel free to um, put anything that you want to say to the, uh, to the group publicly there. You can also private chat as well. If you've got questions, and we highly suggest that for any of our, um, if you've got any questions for our panelists, please ask them. Best place to do that is actually in that Q&A only tab. Um, uh, sometimes I can't see everything in the chat. So if you put it in the Q and a only that way, I can make sure that I will see it. Um, you can also come to the live virtual stage that Matthew and I are on now. Um, you can do that just by hitting the request to speak button. Um, we'll have some time at the end of our panels. If, uh, if that's something you want to do, please do that. And I'll bring you to the stage. Uh, just note that if you do that, you will go through a quick audio check before you come on. Well, Matthew, I will hand it over to you. Um, I know you've got a couple of things to update us on. Uh, uh, things were crazy with Congress last week, but for the most part, they've been pretty sleepy during uh, during December. So why don't you go ahead and take it? Sure. Thanks, Wes. Happy New Year to everybody. Glad to be here with uh, everybody. So. Um, before we start talking about this Congress, um, I did want to just go back just because we haven't met uh, in a little bit of time and talk about the omnibus funding bill that uh, Congress passed uh, December 23rd to fund the government uh, through the remainder of this fiscal year that ends on September uh, 30th, 2023. There are a couple items that we should highlight in that $1.7 trillion package uh, that President Biden has signed into law. Um, number one, uh, the package uh, does for um, include $85 million um, in HUD funding to, for Yes in My Backyard, uh, incentive program funding. And this is important because one of the key issues that we face as an industry, both on the student housing side and on the conventional side, uh, is that we run into a lot of uh, zoning rules and uh, barriers at the state and local level. So this incentive program uh, is designed to help localities eliminate exclusionary uh, policies, zoning and density restrictions, owners, parking requirements, and other, and other regs, and it's a, it's a grant program. So it's notable that the federal government is uh, starting to get engaged on this, and I think that uh, even though it's just a grant program of $85 million, and yes, I realize that $85 million is uh, real money, even though I do uh, work here in Washington, D.C., um, I, I think it's very notable because that could have good downstream effects and be replicated uh, and really help remove a lot of the barriers uh, that we as an industry face. Um, on the plus side, the package also uh, extended the uh, flood insurance uh, program uh, for a year uh, so that folks can get uh, flood insurance. And um, one other issue is that we were able to kill a H-2B visa issue that would have um, 
really uh, harmed our ability to get construction uh, to, to get construction workers uh, here. One of the issues was is there were folks who were wanting to expand the H two B visa program, um, but they wanted to cut out increases uh, in uh, visas for uh, construction workers, and we were able to help block that effort um, because clearly uh, construction uh, is a huge issue. Um, unfortunately, on the tax side. Uh, we had a couple of tax items that would have been quite helpful to the uh, industry, uh, one of which would have extended bonus depreciation, um, which is the ability to fully expense um, items that we put in our buildings uh, in the year of purchase. Uh, right now, um, there you can only deduct 80% of the cost here in 2023. We wanted to extend 100% of the cost, um, and we were not able to do that. Um, also, interest deductibility um, is going to be further limited uh, in 22, uh, in 2022 and beyond, we wanted to um, loosen some of the restrictions on the deductibility of business interest, um, but we're, we're not able to uh, do so. Fortunately, real estate can elect out, uh, but we have to depreciate our buildings over a longer period of time. Uh, so there's no tax package, uh, but hope springs eternal uh, that the Congress will look at that again this year. So let's turn to the, again, let's turn to this year for a quick second. Um, for those um, who wanted a little extra pain in their lives last year um, or political theater. We watched 15 rounds of uh, voting for a new Speaker of the House when the Congress convened. Uh, finally, early on Saturday morning, the House was uh, sworn in with Speaker McCarthy from California um, in charge. Uh, so now that the, now the House can get down to business uh, and the Congress can officially get started. Um, yesterday, um, the Speaker, the steering committee on the Republican side um, nominated new uh, members uh, for committees, including the House Ways and Means Committee, Appropriations Committee, Energy and Commerce Committee, and Financial Services Committee, which are the main committees, not that we don't follow all of them, but that, you know, that really impact a lot of the business that our uh, industry conducts on Capitol Hill. Um, so many folks think that, um, you know, because the government is so divided, that legislation is going to be hard to come by this year. And I think that's largely true, which means we're going to have to really watch the regulatory situation um, because as the Biden administration faces more difficulty uh, doing stuff on the Hill, uh, they're going to look to the executive agencies and independent agencies to write more regulations. Uh, we think that's true. Um, but I think it's important that we don't discount the ability uh, that some quote unquote, singles and doubles might get done uh, this year. And I just caution folks to look out for moving vehicles. Um, where you can start attaching things uh, to move those bills. Um, so I would look at the FAA reauthorization bill. There will be a farm bill that'll that'll be uh, moving through. Um, people are starting to hear about a debt ceiling bill, uh, which you know we we expect Congress to process, which I think will be quite painful, but that will be able to attract uh, potentially other uh, items as that moves through. And finally, uh, um, in the fall of fiscal year 2024, uh, spending bill. So there are, there is going to be some opportunity to get some stuff done. Um, and you got to look for the vehicles uh, where that can move because it's going to be hard to move standalone things uh, of any size. Um, so with that, I'll stop and I'll be happy to answer any questions that folks uh, might have. Yeah, perfect. I don't I don't see anything yet. Um, that was some fantastic information, especially on the visa stuff that I appreciate you guys helping out with that. Um, yeah, I don't see anything else, Matthew. I, I appreciate it. Um, I know you guys have got the uh, the annual meeting coming up. Anything about that that you want to? share with the group? Um, we're just very, very, very excited to be able to meet in person um, in Vegas um, beginning at the end of the month. Um, and we hope to see everybody uh, affiliated with the industry there. And we're, su we're super excited to be able to meet in person. Well, fantastic. Well, I appreciate it, Matt. We'll go ahead and get over to the, uh, to the College House panel. Uh, Thanks, guys. It. Take care. All right, guys. Uh, change a couple of settings here. So, Charlie, I think we've got a, uh, I think we've got a championship football game that you want to talk about. Uh, you mean the slaughtering uh, that took place out in, in Los Angeles uh, last week? Yes, or earlier this week. Excuse me, it's been so long. Um, quite pleased with the result. I wish the game was a little more entertaining, but it allowed me to go to bed. Uh, by about 9.30. So um, it's great. It's fabulous stuff. Well, congratulations for uh, a second one in a row. <laughs> and um, look forward to uh, 
look forward to getting the the next round of UGA National Championship merchandise. So. Hey, you and me both. You and me both. Um, awesome, awesome. Did Alex? Yeah, I, I was actually. I just sent her a message as I was uh, trying to to get Matthew off. I accidentally uh, kicked her off. <laughs> so she uh, she should be on here for ju- in just a second. But um, let me go ahead and pull up your slide. I can find it here. Um, for those, tell us a little bit about what we're going to be looking at today um, uh, with the December ended report as I pull that up. Of course, of course. So we'll be walking through where I guess the industry ended up as of uh, the turn of the year. Um, so data is all relevant as to January 4th, but it covers December, um, December 1st and 31st. Um, we'll break out regional leasing performance year over year, um, rate um, rate performance year over year from a regional perspective, and then get a little bit more granular into the floor plan data. Um, fortunately, uh, with Alex and Jake here, they both have um, assets all across the United States. So um, on our pre-call, um, I think we dove into a lot of really quality um, information related to the different sectors, different regions. Um, and Jake and Alex were actually very kind to one another. If you're familiar with, uh, or you were in, in Charlotte for LeaseCon, Last month, um, we had to separate the two on stage. So um, I don't know about all that. <laughs> it got rowdy. It got rowdy. Hey, that's the best kind of panel right there. We had the best one. Well, so Alex um, and, and Jake, for those that weren't there and those that may not know you guys, uh, really quick, give a quick introduction. Uh, Alex, please go first. Oh, man. Chivalry is not dead. Okay. My name is Alex Monreal. I'm the National Director of Leasing over at GMH Communities. For those of you that don't know too much about our organization, we own, we operate, we develop, we go after acquisitions. We have about 11,000 conventional units, a little bit over 100,000 student beds, lots in the pipeline on both a conventional side and a student side. We also have a great vertical called Innovative Living, which is a really nice mixed use of both. And it really caters towards medical life science. So really excited for what we have in the pipeline. I think the most exciting one we have is we actually have an inclusive deal now with UMass Lull that we are very, very excited about to start working on over the next few years. So really excited there. All right, Jake. Alex is pretty fantastic. I'm, I'm very excited to be on this with her. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, I'm Jake Jarman, and uh, I'm the president of Redstone Residential, and we're a, a fully integrated uh, platform. Uh, we do both uh, student housing as well as uh, conventional communities, and uh, we've got about uh, 32,000 student beds uh, under management across the United States. And uh, uh, I've known Wes here for a, for a very long time, and and it's a pleasure to be uh, here, Wes, with you, and and of course with Alex, and and uh, it, this is I'm excited to talk about some things. Yeah. Well, fantastic, um, Charlie. I can move the slides for you if you want me to. Um, if you will, really quick, just give uh, folks a, a quick uh, overview of what all you guys cover at College House. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I'm Charlie Matthews, uh, founder and CEO of College House. We are a real estate aggregation platform. Um, launched roughly about three-ish years ago now. Um, feels like it's been longer than that. Um, what we do is we're unique in the fact that we work with each individual company, um, work with each operator, owner, um, developer, manager, et cetera. Um, sign a license agreement with each company, um, license the information um, at the individual property level, individual floor plan level, which you get into here, which allows us to aggregate uh, on a weekly basis roughly about 930,000 beds um, across the United States, updating floor plan level occupancy, pre lease rates, concessions uh, in the 261 markets we are in. Uh, we don't have a contract with the property. We're still mainly calling that with a lovely market research team and uh, work with dozens and dozens of organizations across the student space. Um, it's going great. Well, great. Well, let's let's jump into how things ended in December. I'm also going to uh, to launch a quick poll here. Love to see um, how you guys did. Uh, if Regardless if you're on the site level, if you manage a portfolio, I'd love to kind of see how uh, how your experience was with leasing over December. But, hey, let me just go through these regions really quick, Charlie. Um, this was the increase that we saw in each of the uh, regions with pre-leasing for fall 23. West region, 4.7%. Southwest, 16.2%. 
Congratulations for those in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. Southeast, 9.8% increase. Midwest, 6%. And Northeast, 3.1%. Um, Charlie, before I start asking Jake and Alex any questions, any anything out of uh, anything surprise you in any of that? No, honestly, um, of course, the Southwest, which is incredible to see. I mean, that's driving a lot of the year-over-year -year performance. Same thing with the Southeast, which is the largest concentrations of beds you track um, your large Southeastern schools. Um, you know, talk with anybody in the space. You know, leasing is flying through the roof right now. Um, I mean, I think Knoxville, Tennessee is 96% free lease or something like that. Crazy. Um, but fundamentally, even though there's a lot of noise out of interest rates and is the world ending and um, all things involved if you just turn on your local news channel. Um, fundamentally, student housing has never been better. We had a record year last year. Um, I think we finished um, roughly about three and a half, four percent up on average occupancy, which is great with, uh, depending on when you look at it, roughly about five, six percent um, rate growth um, across the space, which is fantastic. Um, as we look at where we're at currently, I mean, nine points ahead, um, you can't argue with the numbers. And I think as we'll get into the next slide, I think um, the, the average rate growth is similar to that. Um, a lot of factors pushing, pushing um, the, the national numbers um, from a rate growth and, and a, um, from a leasing perspective. But um, you don't have to take it from me. We'll hear from Jake and Alex who are on the ground yeah. and all their teams. Yeah, I mean, Jake and Alex, typically in December, it, it's a dead month for us in, in student housing, right? And um, uh, I've been surprised at some of the properties that that I'm involved with of how much how much leasing was hap you know was actually going on. Um, what was the experience for you guys in December? Jake, I don't know. I don't know who wants to go first. Me or you? We both love to talk. I know. You know what? I'm going to take this one and then I'll pass the, the baton to you. Go um, right ahead. So, uh, Wes, I think that this is a continuation of how uh, our industry is evolving. Right. And, and every leasing year is a slightly different year. Um, and and it, it, we see some ebbs and flows and we see some changes and things. Um, but I think that as we continue to evolve, we get better and we continue to um, uh, teach our teams. I think you're going to see uh, some changes like this, like we saw in December. For instance, um, it, it, at Redstone, one of our biggest pushes was, hey, in December, especially when when the students are home, they're bored. They're so accustomed to working all day. They're so accustomed to going to school all day. Now they've got all this free time. Where are they going to spend it? It's going to, they're going to spend it on TikTok. They're going to spend it on Instagram. And they're going to spend it just scrolling through crap. So why not be the crap that they see? Why not be the, the individual that they're talking to? And so uh, we made a massive be honest, so Jake, you just Be honest, Jake. You just wanted another reason to do more TikTok. I mean, if I'm if I'm going to be honest, yes, you're probably you know. right, Wes, for sure. I'm trending. I'm trending, Wes. Uh, but but let, 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 when you look at it, and those of you who are our operators uh, and our leasing specialists who are on this call, please continue to to put forth this monumental effort that you are. You're doing incredible. Uh, mm. Evenings, uh, holidays, uh, times when the students are not in class or at work are phenomenal times to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. to create that relationship and then ask for the sale. And so we mm -hmm. saw some, some great movement in December. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because as, as, uh, as an entire industry, we're getting better, we're evolving, uh, we're maturing, and we're, we're finding better, more efficient ways to reach out and to grab those leases. Absolutely. I think just to echo that too, not only are we evolving as an industry, I think our teams are just really taking the reins on a different level. I mean, looking at the rate hikes, these students are really feeling the tension to get going. I mean, urgency has never been more apparent than it is right now. Parents are getting even more involved, whereas, I mean, that's typically been the norm, but now they're really, really involved. I mean, they're wanting to know when's the next rent bump happening? When is really the last time I'm able to renew? We saw some really good leasing numbers in December, just like I think most of the industry did. And we also saw some really good renewal pushes as well. I know we still got that good, solid push in new leasing, but renewals and retention were just as great. I mean, I have a property in Texas, kudos to them, huge kudos, who retained 60% of their residents this year. I mean, oh, wow. that is incredible, right? Like as an industry, we shoot for about 40% retention. To get 60 
is incredible. And not only which, did which they- Which market was that? That was actually College Station, Texas. Oh, okay, gotcha. Guys, man. thinking about a saturated market. I mean, so, you know, go, just echoing, our teams are on it. And I think on the social media side, keeping people engaged was one of our biggest pushes at GMH was get on social media, engage with people, not only with giveaways, but- actually comment back, have conversations online, like start direct messages. At the end of the day, our frontliners are the same age as our target audience. And so they need to become friends. They need to build those relationships. And it was also a perfect time to really just reactivate those conversations with local businesses and really just kind of plan the year of who are we going to work with? What types of events can we do? You know, what organizations can we work with? Because it was a slow, but also really busy time in the leasing space. So I think we're evolving, but I also think there's just a lot of urgency right now. Gotcha. Well, hey, let's, let's get over to rates. And, and Charlie, um, I mean, we've been talking about this for two or three months now, you know, of, mm -hmm. of what's happening with, with rates. Just kind of curious uh, in what you're seeing, you know, on a weekly basis, is there like a top four, top five that you would say uh, are really, you know, just killing it with the, with the rate increases? Um, so that's kind of a mixed question, right? Depending on who you ask, depending on what, what is important. Um, and depending on also the timeline and the context you're looking at that, I mean, in all, and we use Knoxville early. I mean, they're, you know, 16, 17% ahead. So they're already in that final tier for the most properties. So, um, you know, you're hitting those tiers more frequently. And also I think the operators are, are being more in tune rather than saying, Hey, we're going to hit, you know, 10, 10 bucks, 15 bucks here, thir you know, 20. Um, I mean, we've seen some aggressive changes upwards of a couple hundred bucks, mm -hmm. um, especially starting the year, um, knowing right with the, the supply pipelines and select markets, I guess there's, there's a handful of markets that still have beds coming, but um, new devs aren't necessarily scaring too many people. Um, but universities continue to grow. Students are act reacting quicker. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, um, you know, I think the trend the last three or four years is it happens quicker, you know, earlier and earlier. Um, so there's a lot of things that kind of go into that. I mean, you're what we have and we break out our top five, uh, or at least our top 10 in college house. And it's it's weighted around occupancy year over year increase, pre-lease, how far you are ahead. Um, and then also the um, average rate increase. I mean, Knoxville, West Lafayette. I know there's some pipelines for both of those, but still, I mean, crazy numbers. I think a lot of those properties were full second or third day of leasing. Um, and then, you know, as you even look at some of your larger markets, I mean, Alex mentioned college Chase in Texas. I know there's some, some, some new devs finally coming in there after a few years. Yeah. Um, but we're also seeing some of your larger, um, larger universities that may, you know, they're not your, um, I guess your, your true, I wouldn't say true tier one. Um, but like a core tier one classification, like a Kennesaw, Georgia, um, mm. Marietta, where I mean, they're. 20% above the national average, 15% above the national average in leasing. And um, again, every market is different. Every university is different, but um, big question marks coming around, you know, for, that we had at the beginning of the year was centered around affordability. And I think one thing, Wes, if you want to jump over to the slide where it's the floor plan rates. Yeah. Well, I think it's one more, yeah. two more potentially. I know we're kind of hopping ahead, but you know, with affordability in mind, I think the demos still still are there um, as it relates to students that are, you know, fit each each product type within these markets. I mean, with yeah. a one bedroom increase of, you know, plus or minus 150 bucks, I mean, that's significant. But also seeing your fours, which is the largest floor plan, of, um, I guess, that's common across the space. Um, you're even getting an average of $70 increase mm -hmm. from that standpoint. So, um, you know, again, going back to the fundamentals and what we're seeing from a data perspective, I think. Two, two key themes there. Um, students really are, are, are reacting quicker. Um, they're doing their due diligence. They're looking at all the different things um, as it relates to um, pre-planning. And then additionally, um, securing those spots and really, really diving into, you know, um, what the operator is doing with, with rates and how they're moving and you know, being, we're seeing weekly updates from a lot of these different operators from the data we're getting. So, um, tip of the cap to the industry, to the operators that are on the ground and, and making those rate decisions. But, um, you know, if you're able to get them, I mean, rates are continuing to rise. We're, we're still seeing that, that, that upward movement. Um, I think we peaked at like 11%. I think we're down to what, 9.6. But yeah. um, around that level, you know, 11 to 9% is, is, is pretty, yeah. pretty par for the course.
So Alex and Jake, I wanted to, before we get into talking about the, the floor plans and what you guys are seeing from that standpoint, um, a, along with rates, are you guys seeing um, in any of the, any of your markets where you're able to, to push ancillary fees? I mean, student housing is notoriously bad for just waiving all the upfront fees, right? Um, are, are you guys seeing any movement on that front within your portfolio or is that kind of stuff still being waived? Yeah, Jake, I'll go first on this one. Uh, when it comes Please. to ans- <laughs> when it comes to ancillary fees, we've actually seen a really good uptick. I think that in our industry, waived fees are always going to be kind of that closing piece, right? Like, oh, we'll waive your administration fees or we'll waive the application fees. I think that's going to be a continuation. I don't think we'll ever really see that special go away because it doesn't hit us as hard on an income level. But over at GMH, we've been able to increase a lot of additional premiums, parking, just external fees that we haven't in years past. And we're seeing some really great bang for that. And students aren't pushing back and neither are parents. Granted, I'll do a little disclaimer that some markets are a little bit more hesitant. We have a little bit more conversation around it. But I would say from our end, we're doing really great on that side. But again, I just think that those upfront fees are always going to be something to where we can utilize the waived fee section of an upfront fee rather than giving a $200 gift card. And it's just an easier way to strategize. Okay. We we saw, especially last year, we saw this massive uptick uh, on the conventional side. And so, uh, Student housing in some industries and in some areas and demographics is still going to be competing against the shadow market, against some of the, these multifamily assets or single homes that are being rented out. And as those rates rose so much last year, it's helped to raise that. It's helping to raise us up, right? Because we're looking at this and saying, "Wow, these uh, conventional or multifamily assets are now asking this much per month." Mm-hmm. And uh, that's going to allow me to increase my rate as well. So I think that there's a number of factors here that's going to allow us to continue, not only to increase our rates, but to really dial in and start to get all of these ancillary uh, income uh, generators. These are huge. Mm-hmm. And to the extent that we have an amazing and fast leasing velocity like we do, I don't see us having to dip into uh, that bucket and and start offering those concessions. So uh, if, if the teams can stay on it, if their uh, lead follow-up is on point, I think you're going to see some really great uh, ancillary fees coming in here. Great, Agreed. Great. And just to add on, I think RevShare is a really big piece this year. Just working with different type of vendors and different type of amenity sectors I just think that on an additional income side, there's a lot more opportunity than there has been in years past. And with the new increase in rates, we need to provide additional services. And with that, I think that that rev share piece is going to come in handy. Great. Wait, well, hey, let's let's jump in and talk about floor plans a little bit because this is some some um, information that I'm now able to find a little bit easier on College House uh, thanks to the new version. And, and being able to compare them. Um, but before we get into that, um, just to answer a question from uh, Carlos uh, about distributing the slide deck, I actually just pushed that out. You should find it um, uh, in the pop out over on the right hand side. You could download it there. It will also be on the uh, shoptalk.info website uh, sometime within the next 24 hours. So you can always go there and, and pull that up for this month as well as previous months as well. So let's talk about floor plans. Um, I, I'm just going to ask kind of generally to, to you guys, is there anything within your portfolios that you're seeing that's way more popular this year that you've been able to push rents more on this year? Mm. I can okay. tell you what's not popular, <laughs> and that is shared rooms. And I, I know that that's – Oh, our yes. Few. Right. And I know that's not like the massive uh, uh, part of, of anybody's portfolio. I think the majority of, of what we are renting out are private rooms, but mm-hmm. shared rooms, especially after the pandemic, um, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's nobody wants to touch it. So that one is a tough one. I, Jake, I'm so glad you brought that up. That was when we were kind of talking about this previously on just the floor plan velocity. That was one of the first notes I made just because a couple of our assets and it, it's not really regional based, it's just market specific, do have shared spaces. And those are really our last spaces to lease right now. I mean, those are the ones that we're looking at of, 
why are these not growing? And instead of being able to lease them, we're having to reevaluate rates because like you said, people just don't want to share those rooms anymore. And I think COVID did a number, but I also think that it's just not the type of floor plan they want to lease anymore. I mean, you have these beautiful new developments and like you're talking about shadow market deals. I mean, it's just not really the hit piece anymore. Um, but I will say from GMH's side, those small floor plans moved fast this year. I mean, our studios, our ones, our twos, they moved really, really quickly and we got really great rates out of them. But those four beds, I mean, they continue to maintain velocity. I think that on just a student housing sector, we all know that we build the bulk in four bedrooms and we can make some really great income on those. And I also think that coming back from COVID students really want to have that camaraderie again, and they want to be together. And so four bedroom, four baths are always going to be popular. Granted in some markets, I think there are too many four bedrooms that have been built. However, they still are moving really, really well. Great. Well, hey, I want to talk to you guys about, fives and sixes. Um, uh, before I do that, I want to, uh, one, there's a poll um, basically asking everybody uh, what they saw the most renewals in, uh, which floor plan they saw the most, you guys saw the most renewals in. I would like to find that out. Mm-hmm. And then uh, also the folks that are coming on for the centralized um, uh, leasing panel, if you guys could go ahead and uh, hit that request to speak button, I can bring you guys on momentarily. Um, but yeah, we had an interesting conversation about these these six bedrooms and uh, Charlie, I don't know if you were able to to look in a little bit more to see you know which markets those are most of those are in, but sixteen percent increase. Mm-hmm. What, what's behind it, guys? So uh, my good friend Ben Medleski at Core Spaces last last time we just, we spoke on Shop Talk mentioned that at Core that's one of the uh, the least renewed floor plans. So you're able to get to the different I guess to a higher rate. So typically up to Ben. Um, and a lot of that is, is I guess, put two different product types. One, um, a lot of your newer devs, um, we've seen that being more of a common thing. Um, large units, you know, a lot of them are upwards of 2,300 square feet, um, but also your cottage product. Um, and what we saw over COVID, um, I can pull the numbers for the next, uh, for next shop talk as we look at this from a product standpoint, but um, the cottage product seemed to, to do exceptionally well, um, where there's been a, even, you know, given the fact the campus was closed, you know, your your own home, you know, with the amenities of the pool and whatnot. I'm a little more private, even though if you're a tiny bit further from campus, you didn't have to go. Um, we saw a large jump uh, from the cottage product specifically. So um, again, only about 5.3, I keep saying 5.3, 5,300 beds out of the, you know, in this little subset here. Um, not the largest number, but still something to keep in mind. Um, one thing to note specific, I know we just, you just, um, Alex and Jake spoke about the shared bedrooms um, and, and, you know, are those flying off the shelves or not? Um, I think that also dips into uh, the strong fundamentals as well as student housing from an affordability standpoint. Um, given the, you know, you're instead of a, you know, a two by two that's 1,200 bucks a bed, you're more closer to probably 650, 700 for a little bit of a premium for the second person in there. But um, you know, markets like a Berkeley um, where you see a lot of those, um, we're still seeing the private units go much quicker than those shared spaces from a national standpoint as well. Um, a lot of your last um, handful of bedrooms um, have, I mean, that we're seeing on the asset level have actually been uh, a lot of those shared spaces. So just just supporting that with some data um, from what Jake and Alex said. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, all in all, from a, from a floor plan perspective, um, I think it's really great seeing the fours maintain that velocity again. That's the most common theme. And then um, you know, if you do have one studios and ones and twos left, um, you know. There's always going to be that last student that's going to be looking for something. So um, hold the line there. But um, all in all, it's great. Great to see the year start strong. Um, we're already seeing lots and lots of leasing. We've even seen a lot a lot of new devs. Um, I know supp- supply has been a big um, big factor here um, from a supply and demand measure. But, um, you know, the new devs coming in and we were seeing you know, larger, um, larger devs in some of these markets that need the beds desperately. Some that actually mm-hmm. don't need the beds def- desperately, as Wes and I have discussed. But um things are things are great even though the world may be ending (laughs) hey have you got a have you got a property count on new devs being delivered for this fall um not off the top of my head but i can get that information i can share that with you no worries um alex jake anything else oh man 
Drake? I, I, yeah, I would say, look, if, if anybody is on this, uh, on this broadcast and you're not using College House, um, please talk to whoever <laughs> you need to talk to, to to be using it. It, it helps everybody. It, it gives us uh, really good data. And then, he, and here's the other piece. And, and besides this, if you're on a, if you're a, a site team member, uh, thank you for everything that you do. Mm -hmm. um, this this information is crucial to you. It's also a, so crucial that you are out there yourself, getting to know your own comps personally. Mm -hmm. um, that that personal relationship and knowing. Uh, if, if we were to say a good, better, best site team member, uh, an amazing team member who is, is really making it happen, they're not only going to understand what the data is in College House, they're going to go and experience it themselves. They're going to go do the tours themselves. They're going to understand their market. So use this as an amazing tool to make yourself that much better. Absolutely. And I think just to end on a positive note, again, fantastic job to everybody out there on site. I mean, not only have y'all done an incredible job on just handling the velocity. I mean, when you look at an online level and even an in-person level at how many leases we are signing every single day, that's a lot of work to not only operate your building, but also get those leases generated and get them signed and train your tenants on, you know, what that lease agreement says. That's a lot of work. So massive kudos to you guys. And also going back to Jake, I think it's an amazing point get to know your comps. I mean, all of us on this call, I think there's over a hundred folks on here. Let's get to know each other. Let's connect. If you are on a site, please connect with your competitor. Like I know on a GMH level, we want you guys to talk to us. Like our GMs on property, that's the CEO of that property. We need them to be dug in and to be dug in. We have to have those conversations and be transparent and honest. It doesn't help any of us to hide our pre-lease numbers and our traffic count. It only helps us. So keep the communication going and amazing job on the leasing front. Good things coming soon. Well, fantastic guys. I appreciate it so much. I'm going to go ahead and start ejecting you guys from the virtual stage here and bring on some other folks. So I will see you guys later. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Wes. Jacob, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Wes? I am doing fantastic. Let's uh, get some of our other folks on board here. Um, and while I'm doing that, I want to tell everybody, uh, if if you don't know or if you haven't registered yet, um, we have another industry event that is coming up at the end of this month in Dana Point, California. Um, IMN is hosting their third annual Student Housing 360 conference, um, and that will be um, uh, January 23rd, 24th. It's a fantastic venue that they've got. I've been there before. If you, uh, if you haven't registered yet and you want to save a little bit of money, you can use the code INSIGHT15 for 15% 15 off registration. I do want to note, if you are a developer or owner, you get a much better discount. But if you're you know, not one of those <laughs> and, or you're you know, a, a supplier vendor, um, you can certainly use that to get 15% off registration. Well, guys, we've got um, Alex. I'm sorry. I don't know why you're still, I'm still hanging out. I guess we're gonna talk we can talk about centralized every... leasing if you want. <laughs> there, I got, I got her out. Um, and we're missing Kaylee. Kaylee, if you're still out there, um, I pray for her to come on. But anyway, let's go ahead and start jumping into it. Well, guys, um, the the folks with our um, uh, leadership panel or leadership committee for shop talk had kind of tasked me um, back in November when, when we met about uh, some topics they wanted to talk about. And one of them was around centralization. And I thought, great. Cause you know, I've got a, uh, I've got a panel that I'm moderating at least con turn con on centralization. That'll be fantastic. And the one thing I came away from on after moderating that panel is there's no way we could talk about everything in a 25 minute segment <laughs> as it relates to centralization. So I did put out this LinkedIn uh, poll and asked everyone, hey, what's the one you want to hear most about? And of course, leasing one with 47 percent. And uh, so I was able to to work on getting a great panel together and I want to have them introduce themselves. Also, again, just to remind everybody, love for you to ask your questions. Make sure you put them in the Q&A. And also, if you want to request to speak and come onto the stage, you can do that as well. But, Jacob, let's, if you'll 
start with you, and I'd like for each of you to kind of just give us a brief overview of where each of your firms are at with centralized leasing. Yeah, happy to kick us off here. So I'm Jacob Kosher. I'm the Vice President of Centralized Services at Cardinal Group Companies. Uh, for those of you who don't know Cardinal, we're the third largest student housing manager, second largest in the, in the uh, third party space. But like a lot of others in our space too, we are not just student housing. We're also in conventional housing and have a pretty sizable affordable housing portfolio as well. Um, and I note those because when we're thinking about centralized leasing, we're not thinking specific to student housing. Uh, I'm a big advocate for you can't do centralization without standardization. So we're looking across all of those asset types to say, how can we deliver a cons consistent customer journey regardless of the asset type, regardless of the asset class to help differentiate Cardinal uh, in the space. And as we'll get into a little bit in this conversation, um, centralized leasing is just one of a couple different things we're approaching with Cardinal's structure on, on centralized services that, that brought my role to fruition. I'm very happy to be part of the Cardinal team now. Um, and, and what I think we'll get into here in a little bit is our approach has been to see how can we use um, some, some new tools that are out in the industry right now, specifically artificial intelligence tools, to bring down the volume of incoming communications and the back and forth that, that you know, is required with prospects during during the beginning of the leasing process uh, to save our save our on-site team some time because as we heard from the previous panel, yes, uh, you know leases are flying off the shelves. Leasing velocity is great right now. However, we are in a very tight labor market. And so how do we maintain the talented team members on site to deal with that leasing velocity, given the challenges that all of us have uh, with hiring? And I'll show you a little bit more about how Cardinal's tackling that uh, on today's panel. Great. Kaylee? Hello, everyone. My name is Kaylee Poor, and I am the Acquisition and Market Analyst for V Management. We're a vertically integrated real estate investment and management firm currently operates almost 3,000 student housing and multifamily beds across the nation. I've been in the student housing space for about six years, and V-Management has managed over 40,000 beds in its 20-year tenure. Our company's approach to centralization has been used in the making and is heavily influenced by two factors, the first being our people who not only have extensive experience in the hospitality and student housing industries, but are entrepreneurial in spirit, and our guests and residents who are digital natives and innovators. Um, with these two factors, we started our centralization model by consolidating our phone system to a cloud-based platform. We rolled out our in-house self-guided touring app for show, and we also utilized performance analytics on Entrada to assess and train our brand ambassadors and remote teams. Um, so they can continue to excel in their sales processes. So following our core values of value creation, integrity, entrepreneurial spirit and enthusiasm, we wanted to create a model that combines both innovative technology with our passionate people to offer the most customized yet user-friendly approach to the entire lead to lease cycle. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys about it because you guys have, have rolled it out a hundred percent across the portfolio yeah. and, uh, and it was something that happened pre-pandemic for you guys. Mm -hmm. Good timing, by the way. Um, <laughs> Ken, let's go to you next. Sure. So, uh, yeah, my name is Ken Fox. I'm the leasing and operations specialist for Varsity Campus. Um, I've been with Varsity Campus going on five years now, um, and we are, you know, pretty much solely student housing. We manage over 6,500 student housing beds. Um, which has you know, greatly increased since the thousand beds when I, when I first joined the company. Um, and, you know, we are, we are in the process of kind of, and I'm spearheading the development of our, uh, you know, centralized leasing service. And that's something that, you know, this year we're really trying to gather data and, and enter some markets that we know need help. Um, and we know, you know, the centralization of leasing could really support those, those individual properties. Um, so gathering data this year and really kind of uh, looking to do a complete rollout or, or, you know, a larger rollout for, for this upcoming uh, leasing season for next year. Great. Fantastic. Um, and uh, well, let me let me kind of start off by telling a little bit of a story when it comes to me and centralized leasing. Um, back in fall of 2018, I made a trip to to the UK to um, meet with some operators that were that are there and uh, some uh, 
PBSA operators there and kind of just shadow them, talk to them a little bit about, you know, how they're operating and, uh, and kind of get a sense for how things were being done there. My biggest takeaway was centralized leasing and, and how they approach it. It's very much like scattered site operators do, you know, here in the States um, where you've got, everything's happening at a central location. You know, if you go on site, um, the, you're not going to see a lot of staff. You may see, you know, a den mother type figure versus, um, uh, you know, having a, a leasing manager, leasing manager there and a leasing staff and general manager. And it, it, that you just don't see it there, especially in, in London and some, some of the more um, metropolitan areas and those campuses. So I was amazed at how just efficient everything was. I was also amazed that the students actually were completely fine with it. And when I came back to the States, um, all through 2019, I was trying to you know, tell people about this and everybody looked at me like, you're, you didn't, no, that's never gonna work here. Um, and here we are, 2023, and we're talking about, you know, your groups rolling out centralized leasing. <laughs> so um, I, with that being said, Sorry, that's a slide from last month. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the blueprint. Um, what did you guys use? Was it was it that European model? Was it something that you looked at outside of our industry with you know the, the medical field, um, you know insurance? What was it for you guys that you you looked to to try to figure this out? Um, I'll go ahead and start. So. As I stated, our company has a large number of senior leaders and team members who have extensive experience in the hospitality and student housing industries. Um, but what really helped is the insights from our team members who had that hospitality experience to help pave the way as to how we lease, facilitate, and market our destination communities. Um, the hospitality industry is known for having to um, having a highly competitive nature and having to adapt quickly to the new technology that's out there, um, which is integral to streamlining their processes, reducing costs, lowering staff workloads, improving the customer experience and increased revenue and generation potential. So that's where we took those ideas of how, you know, those big hotel chains manage their sales, manage their bookings, and we've been able to successfully translate that into the student housing space. Yeah, and from from our perspective, you know, I, I think everything that that Kaylee said, uh, you know, is all relevant. And and we just uh, took, you know, this is something that we've been talking about for for a couple of years at this point now. Um, and I think COVID was was really that driving force behind us, you know, making the change. And, and also, you know, it comes from what our prospects are saying and what our residents are saying. Um, and we really feel like we can have. Uh, you know, a centralized team that has a, a consistent message and a very you know professional uh, message to all of our our prospects, um, and that's just going to you know help us uh, in in the future. Just uh, you know, as we onboard new properties um, or as you know, site teams turn over, uh, which is something uh, unfortunately after after COVID we've seen a lot of you know site team turnover and and uh, tough you know a tougher time really getting qualified members on the site team, especially in maybe tertiary markets like uh, Oswego, New York, you know, where uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, you could have some really great students in that industry and or in that market um, and really great students who, you know, want to continue with leasing, uh, but they don't want to be in Oswego, New York for the rest of their life. So, um, you know, that's something that we're really finding as, as one of the major benefits as far as uh, the centralization goes. Great. Jacob, you guys have got a whole blueprint for several things on the centralized side, but let's just let's just talk about leasing. What what have you used to put that together? Yeah, just leasing. Well, since we were trying to you know tackle a holistic view of how can we centralize not just leasing but operations, our process started with engaging an outside consulting company to look at our existing operating model and and really just kind of give us a roadmap to say if this is where we want to get with centralized leasing. What's it going to take from a technology partner standpoint, from a personnel standpoint? What's the financial investment going to be like to get there? Um, and once we had that wrapped up, you know, we went into demo mode. I think all of us on this call and on this panel, we probably get those emails from vendors all the time. We just opened ourselves up to talk to anyone who is in the space about providing leasing services and to, to build a deck that we thought would be uniquely Carmel. And I think that's what a lot of companies like 
like uh, like we're talking about today, will start pursuing is what works with their operating system, what works with their asset classes. So our blueprint was saying, we'll talk to anybody. Uh, we knew that AI was going to be the first thing that we targeted. So we had conversations uh, with every AI provider, not just in the multifamily housing space, but even those who were in adjacent spaces. And we came up with a technology stack that some of them are multifamily specific, others work in multifamily and other spaces. So we were able to find things along the way of just about general consumer behavior trends uh, that we think are going to benefit our leasing efforts long term. Things like one of the AI tools we use is also in the healthcare space. Um, they came to us and said, your current process of saying, when can you come in and tour is counter to consumer behavior. Because yeah. when you're calling to make a doctor's appointment, when you're mm-hmm. calling to make a haircut, or you're calling to get your I, my cars in the shop getting, uh, you know, an oil change right now, they don't say, when can you come in? It's you can come in Thursday at 8 a.m. or we've got Friday at 2 p.m. So what we heard from these AI tools was consumer behavior is limit options. Uh, usually best case is two different options. That also creates a sense of urgency. So those prospects feel like, oh, I'm locked in for Thursday at two o'clock. There's limited availability here. I'm more likely to show up as a result of it. So having those conversations around building out our blueprint also helped to make sure that the centralized leasing model that we were building, uh, we're meeting the changes in consumer behavior that we're seeing. Great, great. So, Kenny, I want to ask you because you guys launched this kind of back in June, and and you guys are pretty strategic in the group of properties that that you guys launched it on. I, just answer that that question for me. What you know, what should an operator look like or look to when they're choosing their their beta properties that they want to launch this on? Any insight? Yeah. So, uh, you know, for us, it, it was really uh, looking at, you know, previous leasing performance, you know, seeing whether they were successful or whether they needed extra help, especially, you know, considering the data that we have from, you know, from the increase in, in leads that we're getting, uh, you know, if they were struggling with leasing, then we really needed to look at that from a from a top down perspective and see why that was. Um, also, you know, at, at all of the sites that we currently are you know focusing on the centralization of leasing? Uh, they all already had a, a decreased amount of staff, or you know a, a lower staff than we would have budgeted for or hoped for, um, with trouble kind of filling those vacancies or filling those spots um, on the on the onsite team. So you know we instead of filling those on the onsite team, we hired you know one uh, for example one leasing manager, one centralized leasing manager who can then you know, manage the lease up of 600 to 800 beds um, and create that, you know, sort of consistent professional message through everyone that they talk with. Um, and, you know, we still have on-site teams that are that are giving tours that are really uh, focusing on on resident retention and, and resident satisfaction. I think that's another really important part about what we're doing is we we really wanted to take the sales pressure and, and really that the time it takes to to be fully involved in sales and that sales responsibility off of the site team um, and take that responsibility on to a, a corporate you know level where we have someone who's you know been in the industry for five six years and specifically through leasing um, and instead of having them you know maybe continue from a leasing professional to a leasing manager to a agm or a gm which is a totally different position uh, really use their expertise in leasing bring them onto a, a centralized program and allow them to to do their work, you know, for, for 600, 800 beds. And we've really seen, uh, you know, the, the benefit of that. And, and, uh, I know we were talking a little bit before about this, but, you know, I, I came, I was a community assistant when I first, uh, you know, joined student housing. And I think a lot of us, you know, kind of come from that same uh, place and that, that was traditionally, you know, the sales responsibility. A lot of it was on the community assistant. Um, and but we're finding that people trust us just as much if they never see us face to face. We were the only ones that could get into the dorms and put the flyers under. The <laughs> that is that's that very really. true, right? Uh, <laughs> but we have so many different ways of reaching reaching students, and they don't require going on campus and and doing all of that through social media and and you know so many different ways. But um, you know we we're finding that they're trusting us just as much if not more from a centralized perspective um and you know we're always you know hey this is kenny hey this is ashley you know so we're always putting our name out there um and making sure they know who they're talking to and and can you know really put a name to to who they're speaking with even if it's just over text message so 
um, yeah, those are some of the, the ways that we selected properties. Also, you know, just properties that uh, might be in, like, like I said before, tertiary markets where we really want to keep, um, we want to keep very talented staff and we want to select that staff and we want to keep them in the, in the company, but they don't have to feel like they're stuck in such a rigid, yeah. you know, leasing manager to assistant general manager to general manager. Instead, now they have a, a, you know, a different kind of path forward to stay with the company. Yeah. So I want to talk next about um, tech stack. And, and I think we've got a question here also from, um, from Matt Johnson um, along the same lines, but I, I wanted to um, pose this question to you, Jacob, because you guys have, have obviously invested a lot of time and, and money into it. What does that tech stack look like for you guys? Yeah, we we have the added challenge of because of our verticals and because we're both an owner operator, third party client, we are we are on Entrada, we are on Yardi, we are on one site, we are on Knock. Um, we also have Salesforce for our client communications, but that serves as our single source of truth across those different property management softwares. Mm -hmm. And then we feed it all into our BI dashboard as well. So our approach to tech was what are what you know, what tools are going to integrate with all of those systems and provide us the, the data that we need? Also being conscious of, and this is something I've learned through those those demo conversations I mentioned earlier, that one company's idea of integration with a property management software is probably very different than what another would do. So, you know, there's some chats in here right now about the chat GPT tool that's that's big. If you're on, I'm, a, I'm a Twitter fiend, so if you're following it on Twitter, lots lots of conversations had about that. But it's, yeah, how can you leverage that? And what does that integration look like? Where are they pulling data from? Is it just what's in the property management software? Or are there other opportunities to populate those tools with information? Um, so the tech stack that we're using right now, as I mentioned, we, we're, we've got three AI tools that we've employed just in the past six weeks here. Two of them are specific to um, leasing services. Um, we utilize a voice tool that's called Hiro, and we use a written communication tool that's called Elise. Um, I'd say another great one that's out there right now that, that we opted not to go with, at least in the immediate future, but we're keeping on the back burner, um, is a tool that's called Adam through a company, Travtis, and they have a really unique approach to their communications where um, you know they they take a good amount of time to harvest all of the communications that exist not just in your property management software but also in all of the email communications going back and forth between the on-site team and the residents the on-site teams and the prospects on-site teams between one another to make their tool as informed as possible to make those to, to, to let AI answer some of those common questions um, you know to, to the comment in the chat um, from Matt, what technologies are needed? Again, it, it depends on what does your blueprint look like. So we started with those AI tools because we said our initial focus is going to be on just reducing the volume of incoming communications that require human involvement. If it's a question about pricing and availability and you know, do you have a pool? How, you know, what, is, what are the hours of the fitness center? Those are things that an AI tool can answer pretty quickly and get back to whether it's at midnight or seven in the morning, it's, it's this, those same response times. Um, but what we're looking towards our next phase is building our internal contact center. That's a whole different technology stack. So that's on our blueprint that kind of dictates what technology is needed there. Um, and for that platform, we're working with Rent Dynamics to build a, a custom contact center platform that integrates with our various property management systems to empower the future um, of our centralized leasing, which will be remote centralized leasing agents supporting multiple communities in our student conventional and affordable portfolios. Let's talk about those those uh, leasing professionals. Is that is that something? I mean, you get, are you guys building out a call center? Is this going to be something that's 100% remote? What's What does that look like? Yeah, we're, we're, we're specifically calling it contact center because it's not just, you know, for us, it is not always having to be reliant on the phone, but responding back to that prospect in the way that they want to talk to us, even if it originates with a phone call, needing a platform that if their preferred communication is text message, that we can easily convert that conversation uh, to a text message. Um, but yes, that's that's the goal is where you know, as we have talented team members, and I think we all experience this in the student housing industry, we may have a really talented leasing team member who is in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, um, 
And, but at some point they are going to want to leave Tuscaloosa. And unless we're offering a remote solution for them to do their role elsewhere, um, you know, they, we, we might lose those talents. So the goal is that we can, if we can work with our technology partners to build a platform that allows them to do their job remotely with all the information um, that a, that an on-site team member would have, and sometimes more because we're getting real-time data feeds from a couple different sources, then even better that we can provide some new career opportunities for those team members, give them the job flexibility that everyone in the labor market is looking for, um, and keep that talent in-house. Great. Very cool. Um, to the audience, I know it's it's at the top of the hour, and we're obviously going to go over a little bit. If, uh, if you have to jump, completely understand. Um, I want to continue going on if our panelists are able to. And, um, and you can, for the audience, you can always come back to, um, to the replay at, uh, shoptalk.info and catch anything that you, that you may miss. Kaylee, you guys, like I said earlier, you've been doing it since I think January of 2020, you guys built your own, um, app, uh, at least for, for the self-guided tours. Um, I would love for you to share a little bit about that, but, um, I, you know, my, <laughs> The next bullet point I've got on here is results um, because, you know, you guys have been at the, the longest. I felt like you guys could probably answer um, the most as to, you know, what do the results look like? Yes, absolutely. So the results have shown that centralizing our leasing process works and we're moving in the right direction as we continue to assess and make adjustments to the model. Um, since its implementation, we've been able to minimize expenses, increase our traffic volume and ability to handle it, and improve conversion rates by dividing the leasing efforts between our on-site teams and our remote sales teams. Um, and we're also meeting our prospects and guests where they are, which is on their phones. Um, so starting with the first point, we've been able to minimize our company's expenses by 25%. Um, this includes, you know, a payroll decrease as we've been able to um, kind of reduce the amount of part time team members on site because we have that remote leasing team supplementing for those people that usually come in and, you know, just do all the follow up calls. We have dedicated full time team members who handle that. Um, we've also been able to decrease our utility spend by centralizing our entire phone system to one cloud-based platform, um, which I love, by the way. It allows us to customize the entire call and texting experience, um, and it allows us to track analytics on the back end of these phone calls okay. and of the texts that we're having with our prospects and residents to better assess where we need to improve our services and where we need to fill in those gaps in the leasing process. Um, we've also been able to decrease our traveling spend. As we know, traveling team members are almost the life and bloodline of those communities that are throwing up flags. So having our remote sales team be able to work where they are um, also keeps the talent pool very open. We don't have to limit ourselves to certain markets to find the right talent. Um, we can meet people where they are. So we've seen almost a 50% decrease in our travel expenditures as well. Um, moving to the improved traffic engagement, our total traffic increased by 54% since implementing this. Wow. And that's roughly about 5,000 leads um, from 2019 to just last year. Um, also to note and shout out our amazing marketing department, who's also an essentialized model as well. Um, so we've eliminated sales managers and marketing managers on site. And that all comes from one department, one centralized department. So our messaging is consistent. Um, we are also able to take that messaging, relay that to our sales teams um, on site who, you know, work mostly with residents, resident engagement, yep. um, and who also, you know, are able to give that same consistent messaging to our remote sales team. Um, so there's no confusion. And, you know, well, I was told I was going to get this and this person said that. So we've completely eliminated that. Um, and what also really impressed me was going back to Jacob's point, the amount of people who are more comfortable texting and behind their phones. Um, we've seen our traffic increase within incoming text messages. That's increased by 600 percent. So to kind of put some context there in 2019, Throughout the entire year, 
we had about 1,300 incoming text messages. In 2022, we've had 9,200 text messages, incoming text messages. But the kicker is our phone calls only increased by about 500, so 500 phone calls. So in 2019, we had about 5,400 incoming phone calls. In 2022, we had 5,900. So being able to enact a cloud-based phone system that allows us to throw people in whatever department or community they need, allows the remote sales team to access text messages from all the communities they're working with. We're able to meet people where they are when they need those questions answered. And that has also helped us translate our touring uh, conversions to increase by about 5%. Um, we already had a, a large touring conversion um, just because of our, again, super talented on-site teams um, but using For Show, which is our self-guided touring app that we built in-house, um, this app has significantly increased our tour conversions, where eight times out of 10, the prospect has signed a lease after taking a self-guided tour. Um, and on top of that, we've just seen leasing performance improve overall, which I know we all as an industry have seen this improve um, in light of recent events, but our pre-leasing velocity has grown 70% since implementing our uh, centralization model, essentially meaning that we're 15% ahead of where we were in 2019 and about 10% ahead of where we were in 2021. Um, also wanting to add to that, as I mentioned, we separate leasing. So our remote sales team focuses on lead follow-ups, new leasing um, efforts, and our onsite teams focus on resident engagement and renewal leasing. Because we've been able to take the follow-up, you know, busy day-to-day -day task from the uh, on-site teams, those teams are now able to focus 110% on giving residents the best experience. And because of this, we've seen our renewal percentages grow about 42%, meaning in 2019, we were about 38% renewed as a firm. Um, just last month, so end of uh, 2022, we were 54% renewed as a firm. And that has all to do with our on-site teams being able to focus 100% on giving our residents the best experience and our remote sales teams doing everything they can to educate new leads that we have and focusing and having that dedication and one-on-one -on -one communication with those follow-ups. So the centralization model overall has just been, it's been transformative and we just continue to look forward to exploring different technologies that are out there to continue to improve our model. Thank, thanks for that synopsis on, on the results. That was some fantastic um, information. And we've got, um, I've got another um, poll that I just launched there as well about self-guided tours. And I've got, we've got, I'm finished asking questions, but we've got a couple of questions here in the in the chat that I wanted to um, wanted to put out there. Um, and we'll start with Carlos's questions. Um, what centralized expenses are passed through to the properties? You guys have any? I can start so with us. Um, essentially, what we pass through to the properties are the phone bills. So the same bills that they had before. Um, so, you know, whatever their phone spend was for the office phones, we've essentially put that into the cloud-based system we have now and those costs go back. So that's where we've seen that reduction in utility spend on sites. But that's about it. I mean, that's really the only implementation we've done so far. Um, for show, of course, was built in-house at all of our communities access and is available for other companies and communities who want to explore that option. Um, that's available as well. And then we just, we use Entrada for everything. So um, really the biggest reduction in spend was our phone bill. Gotcha. Um, this question from um, Neely and Neely, I can't, my screen so far away, I can't see your last name. Um, I know it starts with an L though. Um, leave the question says, how are you touring units in your centralized models? I'll take, oh, go ahead. 
Oh, I was okay. gonna say you 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 touched on this a little bit already. <laughs> you you obviously have that self guided tour in place, which is kind of key mm -hmm. if you're really trying to centralize. But um, I think Kaylee hit on it as well in that you know, what what the centralized and how we're kind of communicating this internally is a lot of our centralization efforts are thinking like top funnel of the sales efforts. It's working back and forth with those prospects to take you know to give some time back to the on site teams so that they can give a better tour experience. They're not feeling like oh, I've got to cut this tour short because the phone is ringing and my dashboard is all cleared up and I have to generate that lease at the end of the day. If we can start incrementally taking some of those responsibilities off of their plate through the use of you know, centralized leasing team members or AI tools or you know, process improvements for efficiency gains, that gets time back to our on-site leasing team members to give a better quality tour without feeling like they're pulled in in too many different directions. So whether it's self-guided or on site, hopefully there's benefits on you know whatever that prospect, however that prospect wants to tour the community. Gotcha. Jake, we've got another question I think is for you. Um, uh, it's from Willie Butler uh, with Empower Property Management Consultants. Um, how much of the centralized leasing process is handled by AI uh, or automation versus handled by your remote agents? Yeah, good question. And hi, Willie. Good to see you. Um, or hear, hear from you. I'm here. Um, <laughs> we're, we're tracking that actively right now. The metrics vary from site to site, and we want to know why do they vary so much. So um, at our top performing property, 85% of prospect communications are able to be handled entirely by an AI agent. Um, that is from that time that that guest card initially comes in through the tour booking or if they stop responding after our lead nurturing cycle ends I and mean, we end up closing out that guest card, 85% is tops. We have other communities that are at 65, 70% um, with the balance being questions that have to be handed over to an, a human agent to take over. Now we know we're never gonna get to a hundred because if somebody's asking about, uh, hey, Ken signed a lease and I wanna live with Ken, um, you know, the AI agent's not going to know, okay, well, Ken is, we're planning on putting Ken in unit 101, bedroom A. We'll see if, you know, bedrooms B, C, and D are are available to push you in there. That's where we're going to have to tap that, you know, our human expertise on site. Um, but what we're targeting right now is if we can have 80% of, of prospect conversations managed by AI, then we can put... Um, some time saved on that and some ROI on the tools to be able to say, if we're handling 80% based on your lead volume, that equates to X number of hours saved. And if we're looking at, you know, that would have otherwise been handled by an hourly community assistant, um, you know, what's the ROI on that tool? Um, so I'd say 80% is the metric that we're tracking, but it varies asset to asset right now as we're kind of testing these out and refining what our tool deck ends up looking like. Gotcha. Well, guys, we are uh, 12 minutes past the hour, and I appreciate so much the additional time that, that you guys gave. Um, we will make sure um, uh, we will put contact information um, somewhere on the website uh, when, we put the, when we post the replay because um, there's some other questions that have come in. We just don't have time for them, and um, uh, hopefully you guys can, can uh, respond to those folks that, that may reach out to you, but we'll, uh, we'll make sure that you guys have their contact information. You can also find all three of these folks on LinkedIn. So um, feel free to, to go there. I'm sure they will respond. Um, guys, thanks so much uh, to the rest of our audience. Just want to remind you that the next shop talk is Thursday, February 9th. Um, we will send out a, Send out an email, a recap email tomorrow, and we'll also include the invite on that. So be looking for that in your inbox. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you did, um, please share Shop Talk with your colleagues. Again, you can send them to shoptalk.info. Guys, thanks so much. Take care. Thanks so much.